about you. The infinite you. The part of you that can't be seen, can't be smelled, touched, or tasted. But you know you feel it. Who you really are. In a world lost to confusion, a universe that's partly illusion, when we look for meaning, we often simply find more delusion. Ground your consciousness in the sounds of the universe, a podcast about your true omnipotence. There's a universe inside each of us, but our beliefs keep us constrained to the edges of what we can imagine. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garden, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. What's up and a big aloha to all of you ascending and awakening amigos out there. My name's Chance Garten. Welcome to the one within all. Thanks for checking out another session of the Interverse podcast. This time around, we're going to be diving deep once again into the esoteric elements of existence and exploring elegant ideas which can facilitate our self-healing and co-creative powers as we learn how to harmonize our personal vibes with the vast and wide cosmic infinity fractal we're playing in. There's one aspect of life that's certain and that we all have in common, and it's a thing called the human experience. It's often been said that the human body is the most advanced biological technology in our conscious realm, but unlike our machines, our body doesn't come with any rule books or user manuals, not even cliff notes. In fact, throughout time, most belief systems that claim to possess such knowledge about how to live an optimal life, well, they've proven they have no such stake in our development by, more often than not, fueling the divisions between people that leave us weakened, dazed, and confused about the true nature of personal reality. But despite the deluge of delusional religions, book burnings, and genocidal purges, Secret sages throughout the ages have swept up as many specks of truth as they could save. And by the unconquerable nature of truth itself, this ancient knowledge has made its way to our age of information under the name of alchemy. Here today to give us a glimpse into the original cosmic source material and advocate an altogether radical model of human potential is first-time guest to the universe bringer of balance and peace seeker extraordinaire, Pharaoh Tehar. I recently met Pharaoh, also known as Daryl, at a metaphysical fair on the last full moon, and I was really blown away by the depth of knowledge and exuberant and genuine love that he seems to share on a constant basis. As an energy healer, student of Reiki, and Native American medicine ways, and a spiritual life coach, Pharaoh brings quite a few knowledge offerings to our altar today. I'm pretty intrigued to learn more about his studies in ancient Egyptian teachings of alchemy, and although I've talked about the Hermetic principles in the past, it's been a while since those shows, and I think it'll be cool to revisit some of these foundational pillars of universal law with our freshest perspectives. And beyond that, we'll be speaking with Pharaoh about his role with an amazing multifaceted organization called the Human Experience and his plans for creating intentional communities with what he calls the Arcadia Project. And if you're in the Fayetteville, Arkansas area, you can actually visit Pharaoh and the Human Experience Spa where you can have energy work, massage and body healing, metaphysical services like tarot, and mind-opening workshops. 
It's been a mouthful to round out the multitude of magnificent and magical modalities that Pharaoh Tahar brings to the table, and I'm sure that I've really barely scratched the surface. So I'd say now's the time to smoke it if you got it, remember your grounding practice, and dial in your attention to our collective intentions to light our inner sparks ablaze with a consciousness-expanding conversation that resonates more love and freedom into our lives. And don't forget to check the show notes for links to Pharaoh's pages, HealingAlchemists.com and the Human LLC.com. You can also check the notes for a link to subscribe to Interverse Plus and get the second hour of this sure to be epic conversation with Pharaoh Tahar. So let's do this thing. Pharaoh, my man, thanks for being on the show and welcome to the Interverse. Thank you so much, brother. Man, that intro was freaking amazing. <laughs> it's easy when I got amazing people to uh, talk to. Yeah, yeah, man. You truly have a way with words. Thank you for using your uh, your gifts to, uh, to to manifest, you know, this present moment, brother. Well, that's what we're all here to do. And after we met in the flesh, I was definitely certain we'd be having a conversation quite soon on the show because... There were a lot of amazing presentations there, but yours was one that I actually got to sit through and <laughs> pay attention to. And I'm mm-hmm. quite excited about the stuff you're doing with the human experience and the Arcadia project. So maybe even before we dive into your background, why don't you talk about that and you know tell people what could, they could expect if they decide to come and check you guys out? Well, I guess I should start from the macro sense first and just uh, kind of dive into the notion of realizing that um, for a very long time, we have been living in this same system, the same paradigm. And um, before we even dive into, you know, what's you know, wrong with this paradigm, you know, just the simple fact that uh, we've never really had an alternative and uh, we've, we've never really had a second option. And so the Arcadia Project is built around creating that second option um, as this global shift of, of consciousness um, takes this time uh, energetically by storm. Um, and so we wanted to be able to have a place that people would be able to go to when they are ready to leave the matrix. And so we, we built an infrastructure. We've been working. Um, our team has been working for a little bit over a year now, um, gaining the knowledge and information that we needed to be able to um, Receive the keys that were needed to kind of unlock this 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 beautiful new world that we have access to through consciousness and and consciousness being manifested through physical manifestation. Um, and so that's what the Arcadia project is. It is a um, it is a a mass building collective project um, that is building eco communities, uh, self self sustainable, self regenerative eco communities. Um, all contributing equal to the global Arcadia Collective, creating uh, abundance. Um, yeah, it's 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 uh, it, it's it's so nothing like this has ever happened before. We've never had this opportunity before. We've never had the internet that has been able to connect information at such an exponential rate to be able to actually move into a plan of action when we see the things um, that, that are wrong with our, with our planet, uh, with our people. Um, people are, this generation is, is coming together and it's through the information that we're able to receive now. There's a lot of information that has been hidden, um, burned, uh, kept away. And uh, this time we are entering into this abundance of information where all of that was, is now finally being able to be dug up and so we experience this process of, of, of removing the veils. Um, and as, as this takes place, you know, our, our energy reflects um, in, in the first three dimensions. So that's the physical, the mental and the spiritual. So as you begin to remove these veils and break these illusions that we're being exposed to, it happens on a spiritual, mental and physical manifestation. So. If the, if the spiritual is about breaking that veil and realizing the illusion for what it is, therefore uh, eliminating its power and control over you, then the mentality now is now your thoughts change because you're, you're, not, you're not blocked by that illusion anymore. So it gives you a clear way to see the way exactly the things are. 
And then the physical manifestation of that is changing your circumstances so that it can reflect the new awareness that you have when that illusion is not there. And when you do that in your entire life, you will realize that you've been living in the matrix. And then the, the love in yourself, the self-love that's going to come in there is going to say, we need to get out because we were supposed to be free. And so that's what the Arcadia is about, is making sure that you guys have a home to go to when you guys get to that point of realization. Oh, man, I'm so excited about everything you're saying. And while you're talking, I was just thinking about it. <laughs> right before you said lifting veils, I was like, well, he's describing the fact that we are in the apocalypse, literally, because that word actually means removing the veil. And so if you look at the fact that we're in the age of information, clearly there are there's no real separation between us and truth if we want to find it. And I like what you're saying about exiting the matrix. My perspective on this is that the matrix is the belief that you need this system of uh, suffering, I guess, that, like imposing suffering on other beings for our own gain in order to be sustained and cared for. But what you're talking about, exiting the matrix, is the, the path that you take where you live in trust with the fact that you can be in harmony with everything that is and that you will actually be cared for and provided for through synchronicity and through the trustworthy behaviors that you're undertaking to make sure you set up for yourself and provide for yourself and work well with others and all the other things that are going to be required for us to actually attain this high level freedom that you're talking about. So mm -hmm. my next question would be, let's talk about the human experience and the spa and how that is a building block in this, this Arcadia project. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the Arcadia project is comprised of four different divisions. This is a system that we've developed uh, using the Native American tradition of the medicine wheel. And so each division is designed to create a, a equalized, balanced ecosystem that is able to generate this system of abundance of resources. And so in the North, we have the business division. That is the division that brings in the resources because the goal with the project is to end currency. So we have this business division that is designed to bring the resources in to then generate to the other ecosystems. In the East, we have the health and wellness, and that is the human experience. And the health and wellness division is going to be comprised, it is comprised of healers, uh, holistic healers, um, energy workers, uh, we're bringing this collective together of people who have these different um, unique healing modalities that are able to begin to cleanse, you know, the people who are now able to remove the veils and understand that, you know, the healing that may need to take place in their own life or how to step into the role of that healer. It's time to exponentially grow the amount of healers you know, that we have. And that starts with first being able to heal ourselves. And so the human experience movement is what that embodies. Uh, we have uh, Reiki healers, people who are able to, you know, help you understand how your energies and your bodies work, you know, because the reality of it is that we are all energy. So everything that is, that is wrong or that we view as wrong or sick in our life is just a manipulation of energy. And so becoming aware of how that energy is generating in your body and what you're producing uh, with that energy through your intentions and your actions can put you back in control of who you are as this energy vessel. Um, and so the human experience teaches that. We have healing sessions where we walk people through. It's, it's really, it's healing, but the, most of the healing, to be honest, it comes from the self-awareness awareness that we provide to our, you know, our patients, people who come in and, and seek that type of healing because we've lived in a system so long where everything has been based on medication, which is like third willing the healing, constantly keeping you having to come back, constantly keeping you having to co come back to multiple sessions every time. And you're not really getting anywhere. And the reality of it is that once you can remove the, the veils of consciousness, the illusions of consciousness that made you forget who you actually are and the energy that you can do and how you have the ability through your the energies in your body to generate any type of healing that you need to. You just need the recipe. When you come to that awareness, then you begin your self-healing journey. And that's the journey back to self-love. 
because that self-healing journey, you're learning who you are. You're, you're releasing things that have been clamped up for years, generations. You're, you're able to break generational curses, things that have been passed down, anger issues that have been passed down, all, all those things that we um, carry with us and only seem to medicate ourselves to keep us from dealing with those things. Understanding the purest form of energy helps get straight to that solution so that you can become, you know, that more optimal version of yourself. And so the human experience is about spreading that information to as many people as we can so that we can reflect the healing that this world needs. Because once we can do that spiritually, like I spoke before, it happens on three dimensions. So it'll then be able to happen mentally and then it will be able to manifest physically. And so they are, you know, the most pivotal part of the Arcadia project, because the reality of it is, is that in order for this Arcadia project to to work, one of the things that uh, one, one of the, the key systems that we have in place is that we have almost like a, um, a, a cleansing cycle where before the people are allowed to actually become a member of the community, you know, they must go through um, these healing ceremonies or being able to fellowship around healers while we began to, you know, educate on the new way of life, because there are so many things that we are taught to believe how things work and operate in the matrix, you know, things like how we handle conflict, you know, in the matrix, it's, you know, fine or your freedom taken away or punishment in general. And it's like unconditional love doesn't have to have punishment. Unconditional love doesn't need punishment. If, if something, if a conflict arises, that conflict was designed for someone to learn something. So instead of trying to revert them to punishment, why don't you revert to the source of what that person needed to learn? Bring that into that person's light. Allow them to understand that lesson. And instead of punishment, leaving a negative energy trace, you're able to be grateful because you learned something. And then you're able to get back to the present moment. That way there, there's no negative, there's no negative energy transfer that is able to perpetuate that action. So that, that's something though that has to be taught. And it's something that, that has to be, have to have conscious practice. And so, you know, things like, like that are, are things that are going to make the, the, the living in a communal ecosystem be a lot less confrontational because they'll have the tools of how to, how to solve conflict resolution. They have the tools to not you know, absorb the energy that they may be receiving if a conflict does arise, but to be able to hold space as a healer or someone who is able to see through that projection and get to the source of that misplaced energy and create healing. I was really feeling it, <laughs> what you're describing right there. I've, I've seen tribes uh, from anthropological research, tribes that will gather around a person that's committed a crime and just tell, like, chant at them or like even almost like group hug mob people. Can you imagine if you did something that was like pretty low or bad or wrong and then a bunch of people gathered around you and told you how much they love you and that that action wasn't you and you don't have to embody that? Do you really think you would like continue on whatever low self-confidence problem you were holding that made you do the bad thing in the first place? Because I don't think it would work that way. I truly think that what you're talking about is the answer. Love is about seeing the highest potential in all things, in all, all people. And fear is the belief, the false belief, that there's only one outcome that's possible. So whenever we go revert to punishment and retribution-based systems, we are reinforcing the belief that that person cannot and will not change unless we – and we have to do something about it physically, like kill them in some cases. And – there is the sacred masculine principle of self-defense, and that also has to be held up. You know, like you can't <laughs> – that's a big yeah. deal. It, yeah. There is a, there's a line there, but I just don't think that coming into the space of a bunch of healers, someone's even going to get that far uh, in, in a negative consciousness. You know, it's just – the higher, higher consciousness always overpowers lower consciousness. The, this works when it comes to inter encountering non-physical entities – and it works with human beings, too, because they're all spirits. The spirit that knows that the other spirit is part of it and loves it cannot 
be overcome by the spirit that thinks it's separate from the others and from everything. That's just the laws of energy mechanics. If you think you're separate, you're cut off from the source of power altogether. And if you know that you're interconnected, then you're connected to the source of all power. It's just like that's that's spiritual protection. That's sort of back to what you were talking about leaving the matrix. That's how that spirit spiritual protection works is that tapped in to the energy field to the flow but yeah tell me about the other two directions man so we've got arc industries which is the business division we've got the human experience which is our health and wellness division we've got the ascension arts and creations which is the arts and expressions division and then we have the abundance of eden which is our food and our resource water uh, division and so um, each of those divisions are are very um, they're, they're, they're ways that we are able to create in basic foundational structure of communal eco living that is efficient and that is uh, eco conscious. So we're able to, as we begin to heal ourselves through the human experience, we begin to heal our planet, heal the way that we live. Um, heal the way that, that we, you know, take care of our bodies through our diets. So all those things, when they change, we want to have that infrastructure laid down. And so, you know, the food is, de is designed to have food transportation services, have permaculture gardens, greenhouses, um, water catchment systems, and they will be able to, uh, transfer these resources to the neighboring eco communities in that area. And then you have other eco communities in that area that are arts and expressions. And these are the individuals who are the artists, people who have the art, people who are able to uh, produce crafts with their hands, um, people who are able to provide entertainment. You know, they have the ability to now exponentially manifest their gifts um, because this entire ecosystem is no longer being, is no longer running with, with currency. Like what we're actually trying to do is use the funds from the business division. So being able to bring the financial resources in needed to create the tools and then we create sustainable livelihood. And so that way the money does not have to go back out at that point. We no longer need it at that point. And so through that process, if we, on a global conscious uh, collective cooperation, we can essentially execute this large eco chasm of sustainable communities all equally contributing to the same ecosystem creating collective abundance. And so, you know, you know, it was a statistic that I looked up that was very um curious to me, but it you know it said uh, uh one out of every 15,000 people has an idea that is able to create enough financial freedom for the rest of the 15,000. You are that man. I totally feel it. <laughs> I mean, we actually, the truth is we are all that person. So imagine if not just one person has an idea that can create abundance for 15,000, but that 15,000 have ideas that can create abundance for 15,000. That's the exponential growth that we are looking at in a different paradigm of humanity where what you're talking about comes to pass and we get over the fear that we need to exchange green pieces of paper or numbers on a screen to make shit happen in the world because it definitely does not have to be that way. And I've long said that if everybody just quit what they're doing and learned permaculture and started growing food, it, it wouldn't take long before it didn't matter that they didn't have jobs. And it's not like the banks are going to foreclose on every person's mortgage at the same time. If we just had a national quit going to work and start growing food day, then I think we'd see like really rapid shifts. So uh, anytime I see organizations like what you guys are doing, putting together these networking systems, basically, of distributed resource production, not even distributed, uh, I guess not exactly the word I'm looking for, but uh, interconnected, self-sufficient nodes as opposed to a centralized scheme. That's mm. the big part of the problem is that centralized scheme. Back to the fear thing. We think we need a government to control that big centralized scheme. And, but originally, we didn't even we didn't need a government for that. Originally, the government tricked us into thinking that we needed it just to protect our country from other countries' governments, mm -hmm. <laughs> not from the people of those countries, because if you go yes. there, they're just like us trying to like live and hang out. But uh, I think that's uh, I'm a big believer in this anarchistic type of uh, of doing things. It doesn't mean no rules. It doesn't mean no 
system of uh, social harmony, like what you were saying, a, a certain basic level of education to get into the uh, to get into the community isn't that unreasonable? It's not like it doesn't have to be like a cult, <laughs> right? It's just like this is what we are doing. So do you agree to do things this way? I feel like that's a pretty reasonable contract to make with each other that can be, you know, sounds like there's a lot of room for freedom in that. And I'm especially excited to ever hear about the potential for a community where artists can be appreciated and can live a lifestyle where they have room and time to create because maybe they only have to work on something to generate resources for maybe three, four hours a day, which is very, very po possible and reasonable. And I, I totally see it. So, yeah. Um, and you even have been reading my mind and you keep bringing up stuff that I have questions about, <laughs> right? As I have the question pop up and I was going to ask you about al alternative creative modalities that might be going on with the human experience. And you guys do music. Am I right? We are. Yes, we do. Um, there's a, there's a, we're, we're trying to start it. But uh, we've got uh, a few artists that have uh, voices that are trying to channel, you know, their gift through through song and through uh, music. So, um, but most of it is is uh, is a lot of it is education. Like we we have healing sessions that we have. However, the self, like I said before, you know, the self awareness is the true education. Um, you know, knowledge is the universal currency. You know. So it's, it's, it's like once you can get to that point, you know, you really began to take exponential leaps um, in like the self-humanization process. So we focus directly on being able to help remove anything that is keeping you from seeing uh, how to have access to that energy. Well, I was just thinking about that old phrase, time is money. But what I've been trying to tell people lately is that time in the cyclical sense as we have it. Um, you know, clock time, the days of the week, the months of the year, that's actually not time. That is a constantly recurring cyclical process of stasis in a way, because it's always eternally returning back to where it's at, right? So the real time is our personal development as a soul. And like you just said, the currency for that is knowledge. You don't have any personal development unless you have new knowledge about yourself or, or something that's empowering you to be able to be moving forward and more, I guess, self-sufficient, self-reliant. That's the true time. So when you say that knowledge is a currency, you're, true, you're, you're speaking about the true currency. The fake currency is the idea that you need to trade your time for the resources that you need to live, and you need to do that on a continual basis forever. That is literally what the matrix is, is that belief system. And yeah, what you guys are talking about here with this project is definitely something different where we are progressing in spiritual time. And it, you won't even know what day of the week it is at, at some point. Like that won't matter anymore. Absolutely. Yes. Um, it, it's interesting because you said, you know, people say time is money. It was like, yeah, time is money because neither of them exist. Um, <laughs> so that, that's per perfectly fine. But yeah, you know, we realized that the only reason why we have, we have time is for order and structure. And so, you know, when you're told I have to be here at this place, I have to wake up and be at school at this time. I have to go and be at my job at this time. I have to go pick up my kids at this time. These are all mechanisms that are designed to keep you dwelling in time. So how do you live in eternity? You have to get rid of time. So you have to break those constructs that are telling you when you have to be like there, you know, a, no, no other animal, you know, has to have a timeline on, on where it has to be somewhere. It just shows up and it's right where it needs to be every time. So why do we, why is the ego of man making us forget that, you know, making us think differently? Um, so, you know, we're having, we have to get back to our natural instinct and realize that we're human beings. The universe was designed to take care of us, not man, not currency, not a system. We were already taken care of. All we had to do was show up. You know, but we, we began to get programmed that made us think that we need these systems. And so because they made us think that we started giving away our energy and our power um, to those systems, actually creating them because it takes energy to create. And we're giving them our attention. And so they're programming our intentions. So they're draining our energy. And then today we create this material world system. So to break that down, we have to start reclaiming back our energy. 
by breaking those illusions one by one, having you realize that you've had the ability to create the world that you've wanted this entire time, unlock those parts of your mind, bring back out your imagination, began, began to set large intentions, and then began the manifestation process. And that's what it means to be a human being. So we're getting back to that natural state of, of human so we can actually evolve into who we were supposed to be because these beings have been oppressing our energy for a very long time through illusions. And so now it's time to break free of those illusions so that we can rise and become the, the beings that are omnipotently maxed and potential. Yeah. And one more thing about the time. I totally agree with you. And <laughs> one more thing about the time issue is that the real foundational fear that creates that trapped in time, what I was just thinking is it's, of course, the fear that you're going to die, the final clock out <laughs> from your job here on earth where it costs money just to live, or so they tell us. And that fear that you're actually going to cease to exist someday, that pretty much fuels and drives a lot of the distraction behaviors that we get into, self-destructive behaviors. And ultimately, it's a lot like the feeling when you have a job and it's like Saturday, you're thinking, wow, I got to go back to work on Monday. So I only have so much time to do all this stuff I want to do. And you feel like this pressure. And then Sunday comes along and you're like, oh, shit, I really have no time left. I got to be in bed early so I can go to this job in the morning. That type of pressure on us is very similar to the constant pressure that the threat and fear of death puts over us. And actually, the belief in that is what allows us to do a lot of the heinous stuff to each other that we do. Because ideas like... <laughs> I don't know, they're going to die anyway, uh, or uh, the way we treat animals, they're just here for us to consume because they're going to die anyway, all of that type of stuff. It, the reality is that you don't die, you change forms, you appear to be gone from this realm, but you're still you, you got to deal with the you that you are, you don't get like a reset button, you know what I mean? There's no running away from it, you know? It's, it's very synchronistic that I, I just, um, I had to overcome this myself recently. Uh, we hosted a cacao ceremony. The uh, Healing Alchemist is one of the other, or healing organizations, which is my own, that does alchemy healing, the part with the human experience. And uh, we hosted a cacao ceremony in Squires, Missouri, at an intentional community called Orin Moore. And um, it was a very, very powerful uh, ceremony. It was actually my first ceremony, so I was very, very excited. And, uh, you know, there was very, very powerful healing that I believe circulated in that place. The cacao was able to open people up to be able to reach the most, most intimate depths of themselves, to be able to look at themselves and identify, you know, what they, what they needed to see and understand to be able to get, uh, step into, I would say, you know, these versions of their higher selves that are unconditionally loving and, and infinitely powerful. And so we work step by step, chakra by chakra through uh, alchemy healing um, that was able to transmute our, the shadows that people faced in their lives and traumas and triggers and these emotions that people can't seem to understand. You know, bring those, bringing those things to light, using consciousness to travel to when these things took place, being able to bring those things into light, being able to identify the purpose of which that was experienced, and then being able to transmute that into your power, and then being able to work on being able to take that information and create, you know, the future that you want to see. And so through, through that process, it was a learning experience for myself and for the people who we served the cacao for. After the ceremony, I ended up actually taking DMT for the first time. <laughs> very, very interesting experience. So it was about two minute experience for me. And I went into a space and two minutes later, I came back out. And this something spoke to me and it said, powerless. So I came back out of it and I was, I had so much energy channeling in me that I, my entire body was shaking. I had my friends in my car holding space. 
And um, like I, I came back and, you know, I got into a point in my life where I, I pretty much experienced my Kundalini. So I, I got to a point where I've been able to keep all my chakras open. And at this moment, at that moment, after I came back, I spoke to myself, I said, I am afraid of being powerless. And so what happened was I feel like when I was, when I experienced this, this, when I went to this space, it was like I had access to see more, but I was immediately shut out and the word that was thrown to me was powerless, like deal with this, deal with powerless. So I was like, wait a minute. And I had to think, I was like, you know, yeah, I, I was like, when I was a child, my, my biggest fear was uh, I used to have dreams where I was like in the ocean and like, like there was no land anywhere direct in any direction. And it's like, it's nighttime and I can't see. And it's like that, that used to always scare me. And so I, I used to, I, I sought out information and, and kind of broke these illusions so that I can learn how to manifest the life that I want to be able to not have to manifest those things that I, that, that feeling of being powerless and putting myself in those situations. But now I had to have a new consciousness and that consciousness is regardless, I am to surrender myself to the universe. And that removes the pressure of these things you think you have to have. Because regardless, the universe is going to do with you what serves your highest good, because that's what it means to just be a part of creation on this planet. The same it is for every other animal. And so that was big for me. And, and I believe that, you know, spirit knew that I was going to be on this podcast today so I can be able to express that as I'm speaking to myself and being able to project that with this platform that you've created, that, you know, the key to being able to exist in these higher dimensions and maintain that frequency is being able to realize that you don't have to have fear. You know, you don't have to have that sense that you have to do something. You know, when a lion wakes up in the morning, is it does not think about how to become a lion. It doesn't think about what it needs to do to be lion things today. Everything that that everything that that being feels, everything that it feels instinctually, is the perfect lion. So when you wake up in the morning, you don't have these concepts of where you have to be and, and what system you have to abide to and what bills you have to pay. You can just go off. How do I feel? What do I want to do based off how I feel? And that's when you come alive. Because that's when you're able to use your energy as efficient and effective as possible, because now you're following, you're following your spiritual compass, you know, so you're able to direct your energy and intent and intention into a direction that generates exponential manifestation. And that's where you start being able to live in those higher dimensions. And that, that's, that's where we're getting, we're getting into that right now. It's happening um, cosmically. The energy is coming through that is allowing people to remove these veils and the darkness is is now being pushed back as we're entering into this uh, state of global abundance. You know, this is the this is the end of revelations of the Bible. You know, this is the the coming and bringing of earth, or I mean, a, a new earth, which would be heaven. Um, or if you understand that the H in heaven is supposed to be silent, it's even. Um, and so we've lived in this state of darkness, and um, you know, now we're being brought in the light. And through that, it's going to be able to create balance that will now allow us to live in heaven. It's right here. That's where heaven's at. <laughs> the thing that, but the perspective, back to the death thing, the perspective that you're powerless in the face of death and that you're definitely going to die actually can turn this realm into the underworld. And a lot of people being in the matrix as they are, are like living in a lower realm, even though they're still in the same realm. Like this is spirit. This is the other side, this is, there is no duality in that sense. So like when, when you, when you realize that um, the only thing that keeps you in those lower realms are the thoughts that you project that create those realms. So if you want to get yourself out of that realm, then all you have to do is learn how to turn off the thoughts of the brain. And you do that by remaining in the present moment. So when you can operate in a full present moment state where you're not allowing these thoughts or fears to project and create a reality that is keep causing you to think and function and act on a lower vibration, then you, you don't have to live in those vibrations where those things can happen to you. 
You don't have to live in those material realms. If you live, your consciousness is elevated. Those things cannot have access to you because you're operating on a, on a vibration that's higher than them. They can't reach you. So your thoughts are able to keep that fear away from death, things like death, because we realize that death is just a change of address and death is literally just the we're able to the, the next level of our journey because we are now not having to be held down by our physical body density. Beautifully, beautifully said, man. I'm curious about, well, first I'll say how, how you project that sort of barrier or force field that you're talking about is just focusing on like love and compassion and kindness. It's like that simple. Those things light you up. They illuminate you and it draws My vibration drops. and it even draws things to you that you can't even see that are excited. Like I know, yeah. you know, like I feel like all the time, my higher self or my guides or different aspects of consciousness that might be part of this universal guidance system that you're talking about are just watching me and saying, when's this, when's this guy going to start dancing? Like someone starts singing, will somebody do something? Like, will you move around a little bit? Like I, the spirit, <laughs> spirit, consciousness, whatever you want to call it, it's energy and being in motion is a big key to drawing that energy out. Like things like ecstatic dance are huge for that. Or Absolutely. just screwing around. <laughs> can play. Yeah. Spirit wants to have Low fun. Yeah. Hey, hey, I'm just, I'm right here in the background. I'm, I'm, I'm friends with Pharaoh, man. But I was dancing and singing because that stuff, it's the truth, man. It's the truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Dude, right on. Right on. That's awesome. It is. Um, I, I, uh, I, I really... The, the, the power that comes from movement is, is, is the balancing of our feminine energy. Our, our feminine energy has been suppressed for so long because we've lived in this masculine driven society that creates only, that only wants to create structure, order and rules. So it suppresses the female energy and that female energy was, is our ability to create. And so that's why there's movement in creation because energy now has movement. But when you suppress that energy, that, that energy now only has masculine. You're only driven by masculine energy, which is stagnant. So it's able to be, because it's not acting out in its own manner, in its own free will, it's able to be manipulated. And so now we have a society where we're able to be programmed because our energy is not acting in a way that is not able to be controlled. So balancing our female energy, our bringing that back, involves things like dance. That's why men don't want to dance. They don't want to move their hips. They don't want to, they, they have this masculine image, this illusion that they have to be this super hard person, you know, so they, they can't just have fun. You know, it's, we have to get back to our childlike selves when we were in our purest form. We're just grown up children. That's what it means to be a God, a co-creator, is, is being able to remove the illusion that said who you have to be because until you were told that you have to be this certain type of way to be a man, or you have to you know, carry yourself a certain way, or you have to have this type of job. You are somebody who was naturally living in the present moment of everything. Nature was the thing that made you come alive. You were able to just have your friends as little kids and just do what really, really made you passionate. You believed that everything was possible. You had infinite imagination. Imagine what happens in a, and when, you, when you continue that practice by the time you're 18 years old. You know, imagine you've had years of practicing how to use your imagination to put yourself in places. You have 18 years now. You feel to create your own dimension and live in it. You know, but we, we were taught that that stuff doesn't matter. That here you need the schoolwork. Yeah, I'm curious now as we're kind of we're not quite at the end of the free show, but we have maybe time for one more subject matter before the break. And I was wondering, how did you transition from? whatever your origins were, it's probably quite similar to a lot of us with the programming that you're talking about. How did, like, how did you find this personal alchemy that we're talking about? And maybe what's the connection to some of our ancestors in places like Egypt and mm. in South America? It's interesting. Um, a lot of alchemy in, in this present lifetime, to be honest with you, comes from my previous lives. A lot, a lot of things that I experienced in my previous life were that of a philosopher. And so there were a lot of things that logistically in this life, I just kind of knew naturally. I didn't know how I had this information. Yeah, me too, man. It's actually in my astrology chart too that it depicts that. Yes, yes. It's my, exactly. Mine, mine does too. It's interesting because what I'm, the, 
the, the ego of this present life, this individuality is able to take that information and it's ego and balance. So it's, it's that thing that needs to be, you know, stomped on for, for being utilized. But the ego of that of my individuality in this life is able to be combined with the godlike version with the information from my previous life to create these innovative ways to now bridge this new, these new five dimensional downloads and to the people who need them now. I'm just about finishing a dictionary and it's about uh, energics. Uh, it's, a coin, it's a term that I've coined, uh, which describes the way that our words generate energy flows. So we're able to see what our words are creating in the entire energy spectrum that is creating and manifesting our reality. So it's, it's words. It's, it's only, it's only about 75 words, the words that we kind of speak in our everyday lives and sentences, breakdown structures so that we can see step by step based off the words and the thoughts that I'm speaking, what am I creating? And then how do I set my intention on what I really want? And then how do I use the correct words that I need to manifest what I'm trying to create? Because one thing that the matrix has been able to do to us, that it's been able to change our language and it's been able to make us feel like our words aren't powerful. So we get stuck in these word traps where we just say things triggered all the time. Like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And it's like, you know, to say I'm sorry is to, is to reject the lesson. You know, it's, it's to, it's to, it's to not, it's to say that even though the universe ordained this, my ego thought it should have went differently. So you choose to not see the reason why, whatever that reason you're trying to apologize for is keeping you from seeing, therefore creating the perpetuating cycle of having to always apologize. Oh, and it's self-deprecating too, because you might say to somebody, Hey, sorry for making you wait on me. When you could just say, Hey, thanks for meeting me. You know, just thank them instead of saying sorry. It, it sets a different tone for everything, too. Yes, it does. It does. I mean, we've got so many things like, you know, we say things like, uh, oh, my gosh, she get on my nerves. Well, now, now you've just created an energy and that now affect, well, has, it has the potential to affect your nerves. You know, you know, I, I can't stand her. So now she's able to trigger you to make you crumble. Like we, 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 we don't realize that we're, we're, we're magicians. We're literally speaking these spells into existence, but we don't realize that we have power. So it's like, what happens when you become completely intentional on your ability to create what you want to manifest? You know, you begin to step into a new version of you that now has the ability to fall into flow with the universe. Naturally, being able to go back to your most natural form. Walk in the present moment where time no longer has to exist because we know that time only exists in the mind. Time cannot exist in the present moment. And so once you break down all the structures of, that tell you what time you have to be somewhere, time no longer has to exist. We fall back into the natural flow of things where everything that happens is perfect in that present moment, therefore creating heaven. That's what it means. An another part of alchemy is coming to an understanding of how the energy of consciousness both within and without transforms from one part of its d development to the next part and it's sort of a cyclical process that is repeatable scientifically and i can experience you can look at your own life and you can see that there are even these cycles of difficulty and then some sort of improvement or work and then some sort of build up to a peak experience following the peak experience, a integration of new knowledge and a change of status for yourself that then leads to the next challenge. And that's in a very condensed nutshell, very similar to the alchemical process, physically enacted, represented by trying to change certain materials into other materials. But the reason why they use that allegory well apart from the fact that perhaps they're really certain people really can change different materials into gold the other reason for using that allegory is because in the external world you will see the clues about what phase consciousness is in absolutely and then you'll be able to work on the internal world to help manifest the next part in a coherent and harmonious way and so mm -hmm. that the next synthesis of the you know the two opposing energies is and a step forward and expansion instead of a contraction. If I, if I'm understanding alchemy on a philosophical level correctly. Absolutely. No, I, I, absolutely.
you know, alchemy is is al- alchemy literally create like the first al- architects of 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 reality because they were able to understand what it truly meant to be a god by realizing that by combining science with philosophy, you can create you have alchemy, and so. Before at this time, we were able to understand. It was almost like we were working through our own chakra system, we receiving these downloads, which would be the God version, the, the why of life. And then we would receive the processing of that information through science, allowing to create a relationship so that us, so we can duplicate that process and become co-creators of God to ourselves. And that's why, you know, it, even in, this, in the Bible, you know, it says, you are God, children of the most high, but you will die like men. You know, and, and so it's like the, the realizing that the entire Bible was an alchemical textbook. It's a science book that what, what and the beautiful thing about alchemists is that when they when the churches began to burn all the information during the dark ages and you had all these organizations that were trying to completely eradicate history so they could begin to rewrite a more programmed system. The alchemists knew that they were going to burn everything. And so what they did was when they translated the languages they translate in ancient symbolism. So, and they taught people this symbolism so that they can understand what things were meaning when they were being spoken or put into a textbook. So that way, when even when the things were changed around, the symbolisms would still represent the same exact message. And so when you can understand what that, what those symbolisms are, then when you read scripture, it sounds completely different than what the pastor is speaking about on Sunday. Yeah, they're talking about spaceships and shit. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, the the, the fallen angels and that are really the Anunnaki. You know, and it's it's like realizing that this and this entire system um, was designed to create an illusion for us, an illusion that has been able to make us easier, uh, being able to be controlled and manipulated, and being able to be based on a system off of fear. You know, one of the biggest things on my journey was. Now, I grew up Christian. I was a youth pastor for about three or four years. And I, 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 it's, 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 it's preaching about fear. And it's like, if you don't do this, then, or if you don't accept Jesus, right? If we don't give our energy away to this other being, then we will burn in a place for all eternity. And it's interesting because now that I'm, I'm in this more simple form of living, you know, we look at the hermetic principle of correspondence as above, so below. So we can look at our lives, right? And we can say, if we had children, for those who have children, you know, would we send our children to burn in hell for all eternity if they didn't say believe in us? You know, right? If we're, if we're, if we're imitating that love, unconditional love, then would we do that to our own children? Or will we say, no, I'm going to love my child regardless? So right off the bat, we see this conditional illusion of love that, that is not truly unconditional because unconditional means there's no condition that will keep me from loving you any more, any less than this present moment. Love, love, true unconditional love means I love you enough to put your higher self first. And to see the potential, to see what infinite potential we all have. I mean, that's, Absolutely. that's all it really means to say that we're all godlings growing into our fullness it's that we have infinite potential because this is an infinite system and it's not a closed system we are connected to all of it so there's no you know there's people that do breatharianism <laughs> that's that, absolutely the sky is literally God. the limit man pharaoh tell us where people can find you again online where you guys are at with the human experience in Fayetteville, and generally like let people know how you'd like them to get in touch if they need to get in touch Absolutely. So um, the best way to get in, in contact with us is, is our Facebook page. So we have, uh, we have three Facebook pages. We have the Human Experience LLC. We have the Arcadia Project. And we also have the Healing Alchemist, which is the healing practice that I uh, operate, where I, I teach people how to heal themselves using their own consciousness um, and to learn how to actually heal their own traumas and triggers. Um, with a matter of breaking down misplaced energy. And so the best way to get in contact with us would be coming down to our Fayetteville location. I always forget the street name of it. Um, but if you go to our website, um, we have our address on there. Also, book and get an appointment with one of our specialists. 
you message us on Facebook, we pretty much will get back to you within about 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, I'm excited to be bringing on some other members of that team in the future as well, because you guys are quite an awesome all-star roster, at least the guys I've met, got guys and girls, of course. Yeah, this, 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 this thing, like the key for, to making this all click is that we have to get everyone has to, it, once, once everyone comes together and swarms and gets together as a global collective, it crumbles the darkness, it crumbles the system. So it's about everyone, this, this is our way of saying, you know, we need everyone we can get. We need every help. We need all the help we can get to be if we're going to work together to build this paradigm for our children's children's children that is going to be a better way of life than just living in this matrix low vibration system that is generated by fear, trauma, anxiety, guilt, grief. If we're truly going to change that, it's about bringing all the healers together. You know, it's about bringing all the, the people who focus on food, health, you know, together. You know, it's about bringing all the artists and jewelry makers and fine crafters together. It's about bringing all the people who know business innovation and metaphysics and sciences and, and studies, all those people together and saying, let's build solutions together. Yeah, because when we come together, we can all learn from each other. And then you don't have to just be a jewelry maker. You can learn how to do permaculture. You can learn all of you can learn it all. Actually, part of the whole matrix system is the illusion that it's a good idea to be a specialist in just one thing and have basically no knowledge on other stuff. Like you, my man, are definitely a generalist, and I appreciate that. I especially like that word because the root of the prefix gen is the generation or generative principle. If you're a generalist, then you can generate. If you are a specialist, then you're a spec. <laughs> Uh, I just thought of that, but I'm going to keep saying it. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Yeah. All right, man. You got anything else for the uh, free listeners before we take our break? The time is now. That's all you need to know, folks. <laughs> yeah, we can shut her down. Okay, man. We'll uh, take our break and I'll see you on the other side. We got another show on the books. A good one, too. Thank you, Pharaoh Tahar, for coming on the podcast. I knew as soon as I met this guy that we would have a dank conversation. <laughs> I really enjoyed the kind of Gnostic vibe that this podcast had in some parts. I do think it's very important to question a lot of even what are considered spiritual or scripture type texts. Because, like Daryl mentioned, there's not really any sense in the concept of a loving God that would only pick certain children of his to protect and even help those children kill other ones. That doesn't make any sense at all. And that's kind of the root foundation of Gnosticism, realizing that maybe there's more than one entity out there that has a stake in the game. And maybe some entities have convinced humanity that they're on our side, but they're actually almost in like a predatory-like sense feeding on certain types of energies and outcomes that human beings create. <laughs> We've all heard of the concept of food from the gods, but what about food for the gods? Right, you don't want to be that. That's why I don't eat animals, guys. As above, so below, so within, so without. I don't want to exist as a farm animal, so I don't really want farm animals to exist for me. And although we didn't talk as much about hermeticism in detail as I thought we might, I thought maybe instead I could give you guys a, a brief rundown 
of the Hermetic Laws. I've done this before on the show, but like I said, it was a long time ago, and I don't see why I shouldn't give everyone a refresher or maybe a first-time exposure to these principles of natural law that once integrated into our perspectives and awarenesses can be extremely enlightening. So I found a kind of short article write up about these seven laws and I thought it might be good if I just read this. This is coming from a website called simland.com. I just found it on DuckDuckGo when I Googled the seven hermetic principles. And maybe I should just explain them from my own understanding, but I feel like reading this instead. (laughs) Number one is the principle of mentalism. The all is mind. The universe is mental. Everything that exists is spirit. Matter is just densified spirit. Spirit is just refined matter. All is energy. The all, the substantial reality underlying the outward manifestations of appearances which we know as the universe, is actually spirit. Everything is spirit. It's undefinable but considered as a universal living mind. All is mind embodies the idea that everything that happens has to be the result of a mental state that precedes it. Think about that. When you think about it in a commonsensical way, then it's simply about creating things twice. That is, first there's a thought or design in your head, and then you manifest it into its actual physical form and reality. And if that's how it works for humans, then it makes total sense that that's how it works for the universe. Number two is the principle of correspondence. As above, so below. As within, so without. As the universe, so the soul. This is a pretty much foundational alchemical understanding. The phrase is very common in hermetic philosophy. It basically means that everything, all of the planes of existence are connected and in correspondence. The macrocosm is found in the microcosm and vice versa. Solar systems, societies, and life on earth reflect the same thing on the cellular and atomic level. What that means is in an everyday setting, Whatever we do on the micro level will also happen on the macro level. Even the tiniest of habits influence the grand scheme of our behavior. As we do anything, so will we do everything. If you slack off in one area of your life, the others will also suffer. Even more, the outer world is a reflection of the inner world. The thoughts and images we hold in our consciousness begin to subconsciously manifest themselves in our external circumstances. The mind takes everything as it is. It doesn't distinguish the substantial from the real and begins to recreate exactly that which we focus on the most. We talked about that idea a lot in this episode. Number three is the principle of vibration. Nothing rests. Everything moves. Everything vibrates. This principle says that everything stating from the largest of matter down to the tiniest of particles is at different degrees of vibration. Modern science can endorse that every atom and molecule is vibrating at certain motion, speed, and frequency. The combination of this energy determines the physical or substantial form of any given object. Even something that seems to be still, for example, a chair, is actually in a state of motion. Its electrons are still moving around and there's even space between them. Nothing is at rest. The practical application to this is described as mental transmutation. Change your mental state and you change your vibration. This is done by the power of will, by deliberately concentrating on a more desirable state of mind. Whatever you focus on most in your life is what grows. What's more, because the universe is mental and governed by the law of correspondence, changing your own mode of being influences the rest of the universe as well. Man, and that's not that's definitely a topic that we got into with Paul last week. (laughs) I love how these shows actually kind of jive with each other. The whole month will almost feel like there's a theme, or at least from guest to guest, there's some kind of common thread. And I don't plan it that way. It just works out that way, probably because of these laws that I'm talking about. Number four is the principle of polarity. Everything is dual. Everything has poles. Everything has its pair of opposites, like and unlike, are the same. Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degree. Extremes meet. All truths are but half-truths. All paradoxes may be reconciled. 
Polarity means that the extreme opposites are actually the different degrees of the same thing. Take temperature, for example. Heat and cold are not distinct entities or phenomenon, but the same thing. Their only difference lies in the matter of degree. This applies to light, too. There's not actually light and dark. There's just different degrees of light. <laughs> and the same goes for good and evil. Evil isn't real. There's just lesser and greater degrees of good. And same with love and fear. Fear is totally an illusion. Fear is a lack of love. This same principle can also be found on the mental plane. Uh, there's, so, there's so many places where this is a apparent principle. But we get this idea that the polarities are real and that some people are actually evil, but they're just missing love. That's all there is to it. The difference between opposites is what is determined by the law of vibration. Some emotions vibrate on a higher level where others are on a lower. Number five, the principle of rhythm. Everything flows out and in. Everything has its tides. All things rise and fall. The pendulum swing manifests in everything. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. Rhythm compensates. This principle explains that there is rhythm between every pair of opposites or poles. Rhythm is the force that enables transition from one pole to another. After every success, there will eventually be some failures. For every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. Remembering the law of rhythm is very important for your state of happiness and well-being. If you're used to living in abundance constantly, then times of scarcity will have a much greater impact on you than on someone who hasn't been as well off. Keep in mind that shit will hit the fan sooner or later. Using negative visualization and anti-positive thinking can help you prepare for that. Hey, so <laughs> I want to jump in on the reading here and just mention that's kind of why I'm interested in conspiracy stuff because you have the ability to visualize the negative and prepare for it and mitigate it. The key is to not be negatively influenced by that harsh pendulum swing. You have to not get attached to things in life and not base your happiness on external objects, people, or circumstances that lie outside your control. Most people can't even control their own emotions and are riding the ups and downs of a roller coaster all day. You should strive towards a state of consciousness that's mostly indifferent, blissfully non-attached despite the conditions you may find yourself in. Being indifferent doesn't mean being unhappy. It just means basically you're neutral but your neutral state is actually a great state to be in. It feels good. The principle of cause and effect is number six. Every cause has its effect. Every effect has its cause. Everything happens according to law. Chance is but a name for law not recognized. <laughs> there are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law. There is no such thing as chance. <laughs> Chance is just a term we use when the exact causes of certain effects are not recognized or perceived. Every cause has its effect and there's an underlying law that makes it happen. If you understand the consequences of your actions, then you can choose what actions you're going to take. You can choose what actions to take, but in so doing, you also choose the consequences that follow. In principle, be the cause, not the effect. Be proactive, act or be acted upon. Being the cause means you are the master instead of the victim. This is the law of polarity. Change your polarity with the power of your mind and free will. And to cut in here to the reading, I will also say about the law of the cause and effect law that the principle of mentalism has a lot to do with the cause and effect because the mental plane is the causal realm and the physical plane is the realm of effects. So keep in mind, it's very hard to do anything to change the realm of effects because they've already happened. It's the truth. It's what's there. But if you can influence the causal realm, which is the mental conditions that create the outcomes, then you actually can change the effects that manifest in the physical world. And the last one, number seven, is the principle of gender. Gender is in everything. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles. Gender manifests on all planes. Gender is manifested in everything. There are polar opposites, the yin and yang. Every person has a biological sex with a male or female physical body. However, psychologically, both qualities exist simultaneously in everyone. 
The same principle can be found in other things as well. Even the brain has a left and right hemisphere that corresponds with respectable gender traits. Gender is manifested as masculine and feminine principles alike across all planes. The masculine principle is in the direction of giving out and expanding. Masculinity embodies yang energy, the sun and its flames that scorch the earth, but at the same time give life to it. It's the will, the desire to achieve something and take the necessary action. I'll also say that the masculine principle is the no, saying no, and it has a lot to do with self-defense. The feminine principle is directed towards receiving and absorbing. Femininity embodies yin energy, the moon and the flow of water that restores and soothes the burning warrior. This is the trait of creativity, spontaneity, feeling, and imagination. And honestly, to say the feminine is the creative one is kind of a not correct in my view. I would say that both components are required for creativity. And if you're in balance in one way or the other, the expression will be more flowy and sort of boundaryless if you're on the feminine side. And if you're on the masculine side, it will be very mathematical and angular. But what we're talking about when creating something that's like a real masterpiece of harmony, it's balancing those two things. Without the feminine, the masculine is apt to act without restraint, order, or reason, resulting in chaos. The feminine alone, on the other hand, is apt to constantly reflect and fail to actually do anything, resulting in stagnation. With both masculine and feminine working in conjunction, there is thoughtful action that breeds success, which points out that both the feminine and the masculine fulfill each other. And like I said, this isn't anything to do with women or men being better or worse, particularly at one of these principles of gender. They're both in all of us and in every everything. <laughs> There's more to that article. I will link it in the show notes if you're curious about it. But really just Google seven hermetic laws or principles and you'll find plenty of videos and people happy to explain this ancient but extremely helpful set of natural laws that give us a much better understanding of cause and effect, especially. We know we need to change our behaviors and actions to change our lives, but these principles help us see the way that our thoughts are actually creating those behaviors and actions. And I had a great time talking to Pharaoh about this type of stuff. I especially liked how we both agree on the idea of reducing the amount of planning in your daily life and going towards synchronicity and letting the universe lead you towards things. Another way of putting it is learning to let things come to you instead of seeking and not finding. I call it bumbling or bumbleology. Basically, I don't worry about stuff very much and then the right thing always happens and everything works out. <laughs> you can do it too. All there is to it is to just not worry about stuff. And if you ever catch yourself overthinking about something that's not happened yet, then just remember that if you trust yourself, then you'll do the right thing when you get to whatever that event is that you're trying to plan out in your mind. You don't actually have to have all of this energy spent towards thinking about every little detail of something that you're going to do when you're not actually doing it. And there's a difference between that and sort of like daydreaming and imagining something that is a positive thing where you're almost bringing the manifestation of that thing closer to you. You'll know the difference. If it's some if you're stressed and it's like a thought pattern you just can't get out of, then it's probably one of these future traps that your mind can get into where you're trying to plan stuff. But if you if it's fun and you're just having wild imagination, well, that's different. This is up to you guys to figure out for yourself, of course. I'm not like your teacher. <laughs> but Pharaoh is definitely a teacher. And in the plus extension, he talked about his past experience as a youth pastor teacher, how youth pastor Daryl transformed into alchemist Pharaoh Tahar. And I thought that was a pretty cool story. I really hope you guys do get on the plus extension. You can find the links to that in the show notes for this podcast. We also talked about Gnostic awareness and reality transmutation, serving the higher self instead of the ego, the parapsychological research of Dean Radin, influencing the past, present, and future with imagination, discussion of the illusory nature of fear, 
We talked about relaxing the schedule and deprogramming from the idea that activity equals productivity and activating the chakras by learning what limits their expression, the 5D future and life beyond time, and the story of how Pharaoh realigned my spine when we first met. And that's just a little bit of what we talked about in the Plus Extension. I probably don't push it enough in these outros, but I'd really like to see more of you guys subscribe to Plus. It is a shame whenever an episode gets out and not a single new person signs up. And it probably has a lot to do with my promoting of the show. I don't work nearly as hard on getting it out to new people as I do on actually making it. And I'm working on that. I'm trying to find new strategies for delivering that type of exposure, but it is tricky. The best thing that would help would be if you guys listening helped promote the show. Tell your friends about it. That's the best thing. I mean, you can tell them online, but show them in person is even better because then they are like, oh, wow, this is a real thing. They can see the aesthetic work that I put into it if they check out a video version or whatever. But expose your friends to this show if you think that they're interested in self-empowerment and self-knowledge and creativity and all the fun stuff we get up to here. And of course, many people might not want to set up a recurring donation, subscription, and I understand that. So I've been making the episodes available as one-off purchases for only $2, which is, I think, not much at all, less than your Starbucks, <laughs> and you get two hours of Interverse. Think about it this way. If you are a fan of this show and you're not on Plus, imagine missing half of the episodes. That's actually what it's like because you get twice as much podcast if you're on Plus. You're literally missing half the show if you're not. And I can tell you that after we're warmed up with an hour of conversation, the second hour is always way more mind-blowing. And I have exciting news. I'm actually doing something else to try to raise funds for the show because I really need some new equipment. And I really need to get some money to create promotional materials like stickers and stuff, which I'll get out to your hands if you want them. So you can decorate your space and you can pass them out to people, slap them on walls all over the world. And so my plan for this is modeled after something one of my favorite podcasters did back in the day called a money bomb. I got this idea from Greg Carlwood of the Higher Side Chats podcast. Amazing show. I highly recommend checking that one out. And the idea is simple. You guys can get on my website, interversepodcast.com slash money bomb. There's a big link at the top of the page. And you can donate money through the PayPal link there. And everybody that donates money will be entered to win at the end of February half of the money raised. I know there are a lot of you out there like myself who are very close to the verge of going full time with their art. And maybe a little cash infusion would be just what you need to buy some merchandise for your vendor booth or get some equipment that you need to actually get the ball rolling or whatever the case may be. So donate to the Interverse Artist Aid Money Bomb for February. And you might just be that person who gets that little boost that you need. And even if you aren't, you can feel good about the fact that you contributed to both the podcast and to another artist's journey of self-reliance. I will be announcing a winner at the end of the month, end of February. So please get on there, donate as much as you can or as much as you want to. For every $5 donated, you get a bonus entry. So I do want it to I do want to make it a little sweeter of a sweepstakes for people who donate more. I think that's only fair. Let me know if you disagree, if you think it should be straight random. But I'm going to be picking the name with a random number generator. I'll probably even do it in some kind of a live broadcast on Facebook Live or something. That way everyone can see how I come to the person, come to their name, see that it's fully random. I'm pretty excited about it. I would have done this through a site like GoFundMe, but all those sites have rules. You're not allowed to do a raffle, which I think is weird, but I want to help you guys as much as I want to help myself. And so we're going to do this and see how it goes. Maybe we'll do it on a monthly basis or a seasonal basis. If it goes well, help me out by sharing this contest and we'll have a great time with this money bomb thing. If you're like me, you may have had the mindset about money that it's pure evil. And while money is used for evil, no doubt, and centrally controlled money that's taxed is definitely evil. 
I'm still in a reality situation where I needed to eat and I'm working on that. But I bet a lot of you also still actually need money. So we got to change our mindsets about money and be open to receiving it. And part of that, that that will also be connected to the law of correspondence, that if you give more, you might be likely to receive more. But this is not a televangelist thing. I'm not one of those preachers on TV saying, give your last $10 to God and he'll give you $500 later. <laughs> no. I mean, maybe nothing positive will benefit in your life from donating to the money bomb. I don't know. But if you feel good about it, I feel like that's a positive. So if it feels good, do it. Donate to the Interverse Artist Aid Money Bomb or become a Plus member or just buy this episode for $2 off the website and get the extension. Thanks for listening to me on the fundraising, but we got to get this show growing. We got to get this thing moving and expanding. So share it, share the podcast, share the contest. Go leave a review on the iTunes podcast app. Five-star review always helps new people find the show. There's lots of ways you can help. Help me help you. Because the more of you that are helping me make this show, the more shows I'll make, the better they'll be. And theoretically, you'll get more out of them. And if you're like a person that gets out in the world a lot, maybe you vend at festivals or something like that, or you just are very personable and like to hype up stuff that you like, let me know. I'll send you a package of Interverse business cards and stickers, and you can help me promote out in meat space. I would love that. It would be so awesome. Some of you have already done stuff like this. I have one listener, Emily, who actually painted rocks with the website and the podcast name on them and left them out in a park or something like that. So cool. There's a lot of free ways and creative ways that you can get the word out about Interverse Podcast. Yeah. But I love you guys. I really appreciate that you're even listening. It's awesome. Go check out Feroz Tahar, The Human Experience, and Healing Alchemist. Also, The Arcadia Project. And I've got to remind you that the new intro music is by Wisdom Traders. You can find Wisdom Traders on SoundCloud. I love that new intro. Really enjoying having it. And the music that I put is the bumper music. And at the end of the show is by a guy named Nico Luminous. You can find on SoundCloud. Both Wisdom Traders and Nico Luminous will be in the show notes. Thank you all for listening. Thanks for letting me ramble about the Hermetic Laws. Don't forget to check out Plus. I love you. Take care of yourself out there. Till next time. Quick, quick.